Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello dear learners, welcome to this online course on legal language, legal including general English. This is lecture number 1 and the topic of this lecture is characteristics of legal language. I am Dr. Divya Gupta, an assistant professor at GLA University, Mathura. Now since this is the first lecture, I would like to brief a little bit about legal, legal English. How is it different from a normal easy going English language which general people used to do from other streams, other branches, no matter it be from medical sciences or engineering side or any other. So how is it different from that regular routine English grammar, the writing skills and like what makes it more elevated. In that condition, I would like to give you one reference. Glanville Maxwell actually said very beautifully that there are two aims of any legal or you can say of any student, right? There are two aims. First of all, you want to, all of you want to become a, a self-acclaimed or maybe uh, a successful lawyer. Many of you might be preparing for PCSJ and others, yes of course, the second aim is to achieve good credits. So my, uh, many of you who are sitting here, they think that reading makes a man perfect. But how much, how many books, how many case laws you should study? Basically, you should read them, mesmerize them regularly and mere reading is not going to help you out. You have to understand them, absorb them word by word and thereafter here in this lecture, we are going to learn that what are the basic characteristics of legal language that segregates this language with other normal easy going language skills and writing skills also. So let us move further with this note and in this particular lecture what are you going to learn? The learning outcomes. After this presentation or after this lecture all of you will be able to develop an understanding, an understanding of verbosity, secondly Latin expressions, third nominalizations, Fourth, embedded clauses, passive verbs and lengthy sentences. How far you people can use all these things to make your work more elevated? Secondly, you would be able to analyze the prospects of language and communication in personal and professional arena. Further, you all will be able to learn the importance, need and role of different type of influences on English language. Could be like French, Latin, British, so any other influence on this language, legal language, you will learn how it actually changes the vocabulary, verbosity, yeah. So you would be able to understand the e role of English language in domains like academics, professional, social, economic and politics. One more thing I would like to tell you, my dear learners, you cannot segregate legal language or legal English with any other branch. You should have the knowledge of other topics as well. In this case, if you would be acquiring all that skill, I am 100% sure that all of you would be able to do wonders with your writing skills. So here you have to understand the characteristics of legal language. These are the outcomes that you are going to uh, like these are the lecture outcomes you can say, the learning outcomes. 
after this i would like to tell you what are the basic contents that you are going to cover in this whole lecture i'm going to give you several relevant examples some specimens to make it more clear to all of you now in this condition you will learn that what is the communication what is communication think about homo sapiens when they started interacting with each other with the help of several diagrams pictograms maybe and after doing that they were able to communicate with each other and we have several proofs in uh, several uh, rock temples which are there and uh, several, several ancient uh, scriptures that we have so we have relevant examples of all those but now my question is like how communication became more important when we are humans communication needs two parties right the receiver and the sender and in that receiver and sender case like there has to be one message there has to be a transmission of thoughts when that transmission transmission of thoughts takes place in that condition that transmission easily goes on to other side last but not the least yes of course the senders then receivers further you would be having the message that will be encoded and further decoded by the receiver understood then if you are able to encode and decode that message finally the important part is feedback so these things are really very important when you go for any kind of communication practice it could be verbal it could be non verbal but the source of law you must understand the sources of law you must understand the juristic writings you must refer to several statutes several regulations several legal precedents which are going to help you out to understand more and more about any topic further let me tell you about these foreign words and maxims which are really important of for communication now these importance these these uh, like impact of these or influence of these foreign words and maxims on legal english is very uh, you can say nobody can like is incomparable and further synonyms we are going to discuss synonyms which because a similar word will have a different meaning when it is used in a contextual manner that means syntactical and metaphorical uh, like understanding of that word is really very important when it is used according to the context remember then further you would learn the archaic words which are relevant nowadays and basically some archaic words are out of use but further you have to concentrate on that aspect of archaic words which are relevantly used some of them are redundant so we can definitely uh, leave the, those uh, archaic words but yes of course many of them are still there circumlocution then punctuation punctuation marks i have given use in the specimen where we can discuss all these things with the help of example by using m dash by using colon m uh, semicolon sometimes ellipses whenever the things are like pending we use three dots right so these three dots are generally used for some uh, expression when something is left out when some part of it is left out in that condition we use ellipses remember so these punctuation marks play a very important role full stop that is known as period and uh, use of modifiers modifiers could be like those adjectives that are used before now and uh, could be dangling modifier sometimes sometimes like explaining and describing the nouns in a beautiful manner they are modifiers then we have reciprocal words in this reciprocal words we can use those reciprocal words in a wonderful manner like suppose if i say uh, and we have a uh, reduplication also tinny winny then uh, uh, zigzag so using those particular terminologies they are reduplication reduplication now in this condition when reduplication is been referred as you must know that reduplication is a part when we use the words twice by changing a little bit of 
by bringing about a change in some uh, vowels, vowel sound you can say, right. So, you can say zigzag. So, here I have changed uh, I with A. So, that is reduplication. Reciprocal words are different, uh, different from reduplication. We will explain, I am going to explain everything to you. Then we have phrasal verbs over here. Phrasal verbs that means like some idioms, some phrases that are Latin expressions, that are French reflections. So, you may find several like uh, glimpses of each and every culture in our own language. Since like India has absorbed everything from different parts of, in, uh, from, of the world, so be ready to, uh, to acquire that skill as well. Ordinary words with special meanings, yes I told you that in, when, when it, they are used in contextual meaning, they, the meaning changes. And uh, further sentence length we are going to discuss, uh, how much length we are going to take up and then uh, for sentences, yes of course we are going to discuss something about functional uh, sentences and uh, second one is structural. When it comes to functional and structural uh, sentences, remember when functional that means which kind of function that sentence uh, plays or roles, uh, the role that this particular sentence plays. Sometimes it uh, orders, sometimes commands, sometimes informs something, sometimes uh, it raises a question. So, they are functions, interrogative, exclamatory, de declarative, assertive, negative, optative. So, these are functions and uh, further on the basis of structure, yes of course, we can discuss these things and uh, on the basis of structure, a sentence could be divided into two parts and that two part is subject and predicate. In that subject and predicate, what you have to remember is subject and the second one is predicate. In that portion, you must remember that in predicate portion and in this particular thing, we have phrases and clauses. So, I will explain all these things, phrases and clauses that you people will understand what is the utility of these things and uh, yeah. So, please uh, be with me, uh, remain alert, aware and agile. If you are alive, show that you are alive, right. So, in that case, uh, be with me and I am going to explain each and everything that is like a part of the characteristic features of legal language. Then we are going to talk about nominalizations and uh, after nominalizations, we will talk about impersonal style. Impersonal style and capitalization, wherever it is necessary, we generally use impersonal style and uh, but most of the time formals, formal style of writing. And uh, yes, of course, while talking about preamble writing and uh, different other uh, formal judicial or legal document, we use capital words. Capitalization is again a very important aspect of legal writing. Then doublets and triplets, they are also very much fine, so and so forth. So doublets and triplets would be used in order to emphasize on certain things. We will come across with certain examples and uh, the usage of those words in our language legal language. So, be ready with us and uh, let us start with something that is we are going to discuss the introduction. Yes, of course, legal language consists of terminology, linguistic structure, linguistic conventions and punctuations. I discussed all these things before also that in our content section that these things are really very important when we talk about the characteristic features of of uh, legal language and then sometimes rich vocabulary becomes the root cause. What, are, what, are, what about rich vocabulary? Basically when we talk about rich vocabulary, it is all about dealing with certain things, certain phrases, maxims, legal uh, terminologies. So, all these things play a very important role when we talk about vocabulary and then it becomes the root cause of ambiguity. Now, many times it is said that why is it ambiguous? Look, I am uh, just trying to explain you something. Why are we going to discuss this ambiguity side? Tell me. Because using some verbs, using some verbosity in order to bring, ver bring ambiguity in the sentence because it opens up plethora of options to interpret the things in different manner. Right, And most of the time it happens that people try to leave the work as 
as ambiguous so that they may definitely find some spaces or you can say some scope to interpret it in a different manner. That is sec second uh, opinion about being ambiguous, but multiple meaning and doubtfulness in the content actually lend some kind of ambiguity to the sentence. So, what is the use of being ambiguous many times because it allows a little bit of uh, scope to move further. Legal exper uh, experts led simplicity and clarity to its meaning. So, yes of course, legal experts when they come for this kind of uh, explanation, yes these things actually play a very important role and in this condition remember that legal experts always lend simplicity and clarity to this expression because they have the perfect knowledge of all these things, phrases, idioms, legal maxims and, and above all they might be having about the knowledge about case laws, they might be knowing about the landmark cases, landmark cases and they might be knowing about recent cases, they are very important. They might be knowing about statutes which are relevant, then legal precedents. So, these things are really very important when we talk about legal experts, like how can they, how would they be able to actually bring about simplicity and clarity in legal documents. So, this is the introduction and then further we are going to move towards several impact on our legal language. The first thing that I would like to portray over here or exhibit over here is foreign influence. Foreign influence that is Latin influence. That influence is actually uh, nowadays also prevalent in legal English. We cannot run away or go through without that legal or uh, Latin uh, influence on legal language even Indian legal language. So, now let us see connection with history of Great Britain and legal traditions which is which is based on common law. Yes, of course, there is a like connection, connection of history of Great Britain and the legal tradition. So, they both are interconnected with each other that brings about a change in the whole scenario. Norman invasion actually it started, it uh, invaded this invasion actually I, I should say initial, initial impact will come from this particular site, normal in Norman invasion, writing was done in French and Latin. So, that is the reason that we are like observing nowadays, it is the writings that are from French and Latin expressions. Further we have 1066 that means 1066 AD Anglo-Norman French became the official language of England continued till 300 years. This is the important part. Why Anglo-Norman French actually became the official language of England and that is the reason why the whole thing changed, the whole scenario of the world changed actually. Remember that you should know that in 1066 Anglo-Norman French became the official language, rule number one, understood? Norman conquest. After that Norman invasion, French and Latin became the, the writings were done in French and Latin, point number one. Second point is in 1066, Anglo-Saxon French became the legal language or we can say official language of England. That is and continued till 300 years. So, you have to understand this aspect. Third, many words are driven from Anglo-Norman. Obviously, when there is a kind of like uh, something is prevalent at that time and it became the official language. Obviously, that will certainly leave an impact on our writing skills as well. And thus, several words that we are using nowadays are of Anglo-Norman. For example, if I say property, if I take estate or chattel, lease, executor, tenant, nowadays also we are using these terms these terminologies which are really very important to understand that these Anglo-Normans are, uh, the words are still been, uh, are in use currently. So, further we are going to take you to that further like uh, implications of these foreign words. Few words of Anglo-Saxon period, few words of Anglo-Saxon period because before this we understood that there were few words of Anglo-Norman, Anglo-Norman and uh, few words of Anglo-Saxon period were also used. For example, bequeath, 
goods, guilt, manslaughter, murder, oath, right, sheriff, steal, swear, theft, thief, ward, witness, writ. My dear learners, remember that you cannot segregate yourself with the impact or influence of Anglo-Saxon, Anglo-Norman. You cannot actually segregate or aloof yourself from these things. Yes, of course, you have to go through and learn, mesmerize all these terminologies because they are still there. You can say the soul, heart and soul of our writing, legal writing, juristic writings, case laws, reports, whatever you are writing, there has to be like this. Latin introduced the practice of using the following expressions versus prose in propia persona, caveat amter, obiter dictum, amicus curae, negligence, adjacent, frustrating. So, do you know the meaning of these words? Like what is amicus curae? Amicus curae is something that means friend of the court, that is friend of the court, friend of the court, yes. So, this is amicus curae. Further, if I talk about the other term, that means impropia. In propia persona, in this, this is the meaning for oneself, for oneself, that is called impropia persona. Then further we have, we have caveat amter, we have caveat amter, what is the meaning of this caveat amter? Let the buyer beware, let the buyer beware, that means the person is actually actually warning, giving or warned, uh, you can say that caveat emptor for let the buyer beware, they are actually trying to warn the uh, buyer that they have to be alert and aware every time. You cannot actually go through simply relying on certain data and that no, you have to be aware every time. Then further if I say obiter dictum, so what is the meaning of obiter dictum is an incidental remark. So that is an incidental remark, incidental remark. So, this is what you are going to understand. You need to learn each and everything, otherwise things will became, become futile. Sitting over here and just uh, hearing it like a lecture will certainly would not give you uh, the knowledge that you actually want to acquire. So, believe me, if you are going to learn all these Latin expressions, maybe 5 Latin expressions daily, that would certainly help you out 5 into 365 days. So, I am pretty much sure that all of you can be a perfect legal writer if you can definitely learn those 5 Latin expressions every day and read 5 case laws every day. So, obviously these things are going to provide a foundation, a strong founda foundation on which you can stand a huge building of success, right. So, yes of course. The next thing that we are going to discuss is words of French origin. So, what are these words of French origin that we are going to discuss? That is appeal, attorney, claim, complain, counsel, court, damage, default, defendant, demurrer, evidence, indictment, judge, jury, justice party, plaintiff. What is plaintiff? Plaintiff is person who actually uh, files a complaint. That is plaintiff, plaintiff. Plea, sentence, sue, verdict, many words. Basically, it is, it has originated, the mother branch is from French and Latin and that is the reason most of the words that we are using nowadays are from French and uh, Latin expressions, are of French and Latin expressions and influence of Anglo-Saxon, Anglo-Norman with the starting of Norman conquest. With the starting of Norman conquest, for example, you can say the Norman invasion that I have explained earlier in my previous slide. So, further, yes, we, we are going to talk about the adjectives now. Adjectives are standing behind the nouns. Adjectives that, that are standing behind the nouns, along with nouns, these adjectives are standing and which they modify in phrases such as attorney general. Now, in this condition, attorney is is your adjective, it is a modifier actually, attorney general, then court martial, then fee simple absolute, letters testimony, then we have malice, malice aforethought, then solicitor general. So, these are things where adjectives are used before the noun in order to 
exemplify in order to modify these things and explain more and more about this noun. So, these are some characteristic features of legal language. That means, first one is foreign influence and foreign influence on words and uh, verbosity by and terminologies by starting with Norman conquest. And from that Norman invasion, it moves towards Anglo-Saxon where which language became, became the official language? I would like to highlight this one, that official language, Norman, Anglo-Norman French became the official language of England in 1066, which actually leave, left an indelible impact on this. Further, we will talk about synonyms. Now, how these synonyms are being used? Synonymy. Similar words are used for different types of uh, explanations according to the context. Now, in this condition, what you have to understand is due to such French and Latin influence, several synonyms conveys the same idea and thought. Some of the examples are as follows by high. Assign, that means transfer. Breach, violation. Clause, provision. Paragraph, article. Contract could be used for agreement, default, failure, lessee, tenant. Lessee will study this particular term in, in uh, the previous thing that I was telling about, about re-duplication and the particular term that we were discussing about, uh, uh, if I say reciprocal words basically. So, now in this condition, reciprocal words, we will talk about this lessee in reciprocal words also. I will explain. So, we will study this uh, lessee word in uh, particular reciprocal words when we will discuss uh, in the next few slides. Promise goes with assurance because these are terminals, these are transfer, violation, then provision, they are legal terminologies, you know. Then uh, contract, agreement, so, assurance, instead of saying promise, assurance, void, invalid, ineffective. Have you understood? So, these are synonyms. There is a huge list of synonyms. I can definitely share it with you. But uh, you have to actually read a lot in order to find the relevance of these words in legal writings and juristic writings. Further, we will move towards the next part, part that is use of archaic words. When it comes to archaic words, remember that these words are old words basically. They are old words and being used less frequently than other terms. Many people try to use them in a, in a not in regular course, but try to actually come up with these, with the usage of these words and other terms uh, often, maybe, maybe uh, not often, I would say seldom they can use it. Right, so they are old words, so they become rather obscure. Many times it becomes the obscure, the words become obscure, not in use right now, in the course of time. Old words are used in legal English primarily to avoid repeating names or phrases. Yes, that is the purpose of it. Please highlight this point. Why the what is the use of using those redundant, I should not say redundant, yes, of course, uh, obscure. Uh, words or maybe old words in English language, legal language to avoid repeating names and phrases. Now, what are these words that we can use? The said, the said or you can say for example, the parties here to instead of the parties to this contract. The parties to this contract instead of here to well, like we use here to in legal writings, whereas the, uh, the basic English language or regular English language says that the parties to this contract. So, instead of using to this contract, we are using here to. This is what archaic words are. Now, I am going to come up with the list of archaic words which generally we used to use. So, let us see. First of all, here at means at this place or point. Right? And the second one on account of or after this, here at, the party is present here at, here at the stream divided. So, this is the example where we can use this particular uh, archaic words. Then hereby means by this means as a result of this, for example, the parties hereby declare the parties hereby declare. Now, in this condition hereby is used by this means. 
further hereafter. Hereafter means from here, from now on, at same time in the future, from now on, hereafter. For example, if I say hereafter, I would be learning five uh, uh, archaic words or five uh, like case laws, I would be reading five case laws hereafter. So, hereafter is after this, from now on. Just because of this lecture, I am going to uh, start reading uh, five case laws hereafter. So, so hereafter the people started watching uh, like uh, awareness programs on legal aids. So, this is what hereafter. Further, we can talk about herein means in this document or matter. For example, the terms refer to herein, herein in this document, herein, understood? So, herein means like over here in this document. Herein we have two parties uh, standing opposite to each other. So, herein, the terms referred to herein. Herein after means, after means later referred to in this matter or uh, document. The parties that were, that are uh, referred to after this. So, later referred to in this matter or document in this condition. Now, further here of means of this matter or document, the parties here of, of this matter and document. Then here to again means to this place or to this matter, the parties here to. So, these are few examples of archaic words and further here to for, F-O-R-E for along with that before now. Before now makes the change. For example, the parties have had no business dealings here to for. That means, before now the parties were not having any kind of dealing here to for. Remember here to for is actually used for those things which are before now, before now, right? So, the parties have not no, have no business dealings here to for. That is used for expressing before now. Let us move up to some other archive words so that you can definitely use them regularly in your colloquial speech. Here under means later referred to this matter or document. The exemptions referred to here under. The exemptions, the exemptions, the referred to here under. Here under, yeah. So, here under, if, if I say, uh, if I use this particular term as the exemptions referred to here under, put a colon and after that you can definitely start writing A, yeah, uh, buy one get one free, get one free scheme. Now, in this condition I am using this particular here under uh, just indicating it or you can say replacing it with aforementioned. So, here with means with this letter or document I enclose here with the plan, I enclose here with the plan, right? So, here with, uh, yes, I enclose here with the plan whenever like in letters when we write. Most of the time in letters, please find, find the enclosed documents here with, right? So, please find the enclosed documents here with. That means, I enclose here with the plan or you can use the I enclose here with the, uh, the, the sometimes the plan, the CV for my job, sometimes my uh, attested, attested documents. So, these things are really very important when it goes for any kind of, I am just, uh, I have just written and just because this is going to create uh, uh, like a uh, things over here. So, I am enclosed here with, with the plan sometimes, with the CV, with attested documents, attested certificates, right? So, you can definitely use this term like this. Further, we can use thereafter, thereat, thereby. So, what does it, uh, the changes that after that time, thereafter, thereat, at that particular place, at that place on account of that. There at payments shall cease, okay. So, thereby, by that means as a result of that, the parties thereby agree. Therein, again, in that place, document or respect parties shall refer to the contract dated on this May 2023. 
So, it is agreed there in that. So, in that place basically these archaic words are used in legal writings or you can say juristic writings because without them you cannot frame any writing, any, any skill, any composition of uh, legal importance. Further we move towards further uh, new uh, topic that is circumlocution. Circumlocution comprises of two words, they are first one is circum, circum means to circle, yeah, circum and is to circle and lokai to speak, right, circum is to circle and lokai is to speak, okay. So, in that condition, so the circumlocution and essential characteristics of legal language simply means talking around, circumlocution. Fewer words are replaced with larger number of words to express an idea. So, that means circumlocution means a large words are used or replaced with a smaller words nowadays. Circumlocution, circum means circle and locution that is lokai means to speak. That means that means talking around and in that condition what are we going to learn in circumlocution that which are these like four or five group of words that are uh, like, that are used in one in place of one word and in that condition I am going to come up with that examples with those examples also what uh, generally we used to do in our uh, regular speech. So, let us start that is circumlocuted expressions. Adequate number of can be used as enough, modern equivalents, okay. Then at that time when, when, further at that particular time, then, at a later date because usually in uh, old English, old Latin English or uh, you can say legal English, if not Latin, yes, old legal English, we generally use these terms, these uh, circumlocuted expressions. And in that condition, we have to understand that these things are really very important. And then uh, as a consequence of, yes, as a consequence of late, uh, later for later date and as a consequences of because during such time as while, for the duration of, during, in the event that if in close proximity then until such time, until reason being that because similar to like near. So, we have certain terms where we can definitely understand these particular thing properly. Instead of using four or five group of words, we use one word. So, in old English, legal English, circumlocuted expressions, whereas in modern equivalents, we use these particular terms. Is that clear everyone, my dear learners? So, this is what when we talk about the characteristic features of legal English, yes, these things are really very important. Then further we move towards punctuation. Now, when it comes to punctuation mark, this seems really very simple, very easy. But without punctuation, would you be able to make sense of anything? No. No, my dear learners, you would not be able to understand and learn anything in that condition because this thing provides a kind of life to your work and add one more feather to your understanding also. Like if some words are given, I am going to come up with some paragraph also, some on legal uh, like uh, maybe sometimes like a case law. I have taken some specimen so as to give you the idea that why these things are used, why, why comma is used, why period is used, then why do we use semicolon, then why colon and then further these things are really very important. Why are we going to use inverted commas, inverted commas, then further what is the use of uh, m dash. So, you must actually know the usage of these terms, otherwise your words without comma, without full stop, without capitalization, you would not be able to make sense of any legal, any juristic writings. So, punctuation is used insufficiently, particularly in conveyances and deeds. We can observe the conspicuous absence of punctuation. And in modern legal drafting, basically in modern legal drafting, punctuation is used to clarify the meaning. I told you without comma, 
without full stop, you would not be without capitalization, you would not be able to make sense, you will not be able to make sense. This is really very important when it comes to this part. So, punctuation plays a very important role. Now, I am going to give you one specimen, two specimen basically from which you are going to learn how these uh, inverted commas, how these uh, quotes play an important role along with the other punctuative marks. Let us see. Now, study this one in the, look at this inverted commas, because this thing has been taken from somewhere and that is the reason I am just using the exact words for quotation, therefore quotes are used, right. And in these quotes, remember that whenever these quotes are there, quotation marks are here, there for direct and for direct quote, if I say for direct quote we use this or whenever the book, title of the book, title of the book is there, then we use this, these quotes, remember. Further, if there is like look this period, everywhere whenever there is a period, it clearly indicates the stop, to stop and to stop and to understand the things in a proper manner, that is period. Second part, if I talk about, then we have commas. Can you see several commas over here? Let us see, let us find in the landmark case Smith versus State comma. So, what is the use of this comma in this sentence? They are used to set off, set off what? Set off introduction, introduction, phrases, sometimes clauses and divide the sentence into two parts sometimes and separate items in a list. Sometimes two, I am just going to write down two separate items in groups, right. So, the, look at this comma. So, the majority opinion written by Justice Johnson stated, the facts presented clearly show a violation of the defendant's apostrophe. Apostrophe is used for what? To show the possession. Apostrophe is used to show the possession, first point, second point, first one and the second one is to sometimes to indicate the hidden uh, word or abbreviation word, hidden word or abbreviated, abbreviated word. For example, it is apostrophe it is, right. So, remember these apostrophes are used to show possession and secondly it is used to indicate the hidden words. Then constitutional m dash. Now, what is the use of this m dash when it comes to m, uh, I should write like this, e m d a s h dash. So, what is the use of that? Is used to, to emphasize, used for emphasis and and emphasis and to set off a clause within a sentence, right? Is that clear? So, am dash is used for these purpose. So, these are few uh, like highlighting features of punctuation, remember. And without that punctuation, obviously you would not be able to do anything, would not be able to actually grab the information or the understanding of the whole text, yes. So, remember I have already almost uh, discussed everything, I have discussed the quotes why they are used, I have discussed periods, I have used commas, I have used apostrophe, then I have explained m dash. So, many other uh, words are used, many other like uh, punctuation marks are used to, uh, to bring about the exact meaning of those words in a sentence, right. So, let us move further to the next passage where you yourself will find out what is the utility of these punctuations. So, now this is what, in this seminal work again, 
in this seminal work counters of justice i told you name of that book will be written in quotes right so this is quotes comma renowned indian legal scholar and writer this is capitalization r of desai look these are fictional ones right so please don't correlate them with anyone uh, fictional ones so r of desai capital names will be written in capitals explores the intricate dance between law and mortality full stop period with the masterful command of language comma desai delves into labyrinth of legal philosophy comma examining the interplay because here comma is used to segregate two clauses examining the interplay of societal norms and individual liberties period his nuanced he his nuanced arguments punctuated with vivid anecdotes and underscores the dynamic nature of justice in a rapidly evolving society period so there are three things in this particular uh, uh three things over here can you identify these nuanced arguments one second one is punctuated second one is punctuated with vivid anecdotes and third one is underscore the dynamic nature of that, uh, justice in a rapidly evolving society so there are three things that i am trying to use over here there are three things that i am trying to come up or trying to explain you that in order to segregate some points in the list we use comma so this is a live example where you can understand again capitalization in the beginning of a sentence through a series of eloquently crafted essays comma since you are trying to come up with certain kind of explanations explanations that through this example comma i am going to explain these things so comma is used to segregate through this example examples name comma i would like to so this is very important now desai invites readers to question preconceived notions that is clearly indicated and uh, counters of justice this is again the name of the book and therefore it is written in quotes it stands as a testament to desai's ability again this is shows the uh, ownership desai's ability that is apostrophe shows the possession to weave together legal analysis creating a tapestry that enriches both the legal scholar and the avid reader so i think the things are very much clear to all of you how punctuation plays an integral role because this actually provides it is the heart and soul of your legal writing without punctuation without capitalization can you imagine anything any 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 legal document or any document without punctuation without capitalization without period without comma without apostrophe without m dash without any other thing there are many okay without ellipses so these things are really very important so with this note we will go further move further to the next part that is use of modifiers how far do you think that these modifiers are important modifiers could be dangling modifiers sometimes they they describe the things more vividly explicitly so the modifiers such as the same such as the same the said the aforesaid they are like this the said the aforesaid the aforementioned etc which are used in legal text are interesting because they are very frequently used as adjectives to determine the noun but not to replace the noun remember modifiers are not going to replace the noun suppose if i say uh, john if i'm go i don't want to repeat the name i would not say the said i would said the said john that means i have already referred john earlier and that is the reason i'm just referring him again the said john so the said would be used as a modifier in legal documents not to replace noun but to to indicate that this has already been referred earlier for example the said john smith have you understood everyone because this is again a very important aspect where modifiers are used not to replace noun but to add additional information about that noun clear so let's move up to the next part that is reciprocal words my favorite one i i explained you these reciprocal words and and even explained you with reduplication remember reduplication reduplication is a formation of words where tinny winny zigzag and uh, several other like uh, the words so 
Let's talk about reciprocal words. Legal English contains some words and titles such as employer, employee. Now you got this thing where we change the last vowels maybe sometimes last vowels sometimes we change some uh, uh, yes over here we change these uh, consonants and vowels. So, it is not necessary that only uh, uh, vowel sounds will be changed employer, employee, addresser, addressee, hero, heroine, lesser, lessee in which the reciprocal and the opposite nature of relationship is indicated by the use of alternative endings. Alternative endings through these alternative endings we try to make new words employer, employee right. So, addresser, addressee ok. So, lesser, lessee, lessee is the tenant do you remember that one? We discussed just earlier in the uh, uh, previous slide, yes. So, there I uh, referred this lessee also. So, this is how you are going to create these reciprocal words remember. Is it clear everyone? Now, we are going to move towards the next slide that is phrasal verbs. Now, phrasal verbs actually play a very important role when it comes to any kind of explanation. explanation. That is if I talk about idioms and phrases. Look if you want to explain more and more within less words, these are the optimum utilization, these are the perfect actually uh, source of explain or expressing your opinion. These are often used in quasi technical sense. For example, phrasal verbs parties enter into contracts, put down deposits. So, and if I say serve upon other parties, writ, write off debts and so on. So, what is the meaning of write off debts? Do you know? Write off debts is actually a reduction. It is a reduction of the recognized of the recognized value of something that is called write off right. So, this is write off debts remember write off debts are a reduction is a reduction of the recognized value of something. Second one if I talk about parties enter into contracts or you can say put down deposits. Now, what is the meaning of put down deposits? Put down deposits means a part of the cost, the part of the cost of something, something such as, such as a product, ok, such as a product or property or property that a buyer that a buyer pays to a seller so that it will it will not be sold to anyone else have you ever done this thing yes of course many of us actually do basically when we talk about put down deposits put down deposits is something some amount of money that we give to the seller so that he would not sell the product to somebody else so this is pull put down deposits in the same manner there are many other there are many other words that could be used and phrases that could be used for expressing so look at this expression i have used now look at this part point put down deposits this is these are three words right but while explaining this i have used a whole paragraph to explain it so have you understood the difference between them put down deposits just three words and along with that three words i have used the whole paragraph three lines to explain this put down deposits so this is the reason why we generally use less words in maybe sometimes Latin expressions, French expressions, some um, uh, old English uh, colloquial speech or maybe sometimes old archaic words so that so as to add one more like uh, element of understanding to it. This is really very important. So, these phrasal verbs 
there are many other many others like this it is not only one or two or three yes you have to go through each and every one one by one so that to understand all these points yeah so let's move up to the next category that is ordinary words with special meaning how are we going to lend those ordinary words or raise those ordinary words to that special level meaning where people may use those ordinary words regularly in their communication skills in their writing skills so remember that ordinary words with special meanings will certainly leave a kind of indelible impact on your writing for example i'm going to try i'm going to come up with certain examples certain real life examples where you can understand the ordinary words with special meanings and we generally use these words for example if i say con consideration generally we say consideration in a normal way but here consideration could be used in contract law it refers to something of value exchange between parties essential for formation of a valid contract that is consideration second we have tort what is tort tort is refers to a civil wrong or injury other than breach of contract for which the court can provide a remedy that is tort tort is something that is civil wrong or injury for which court can provide the remedy yeah so that is tort property property in legal terms it includes both real property and land and structure where a personal property movable items assets and liabilities everything will come in this category of property right then covenant a legally binding promise or agreement often found in contracts and real estate documents so covenant is legally binding promise or agreement so there any kind of promise any kind of agreement or any kind of uh, contract that you uh, make that is uh, that will come in that category of covenant yeah so now defendant party against whom the legal action is brought often in a criminal or civil cases that is defendant defendant so party against whom so one is plaintiff one is plaintiff and the other one is defendant remember so testament the legal test document such as will codicil then specifying the dispositions of persons property after their death so after their death could be used moreover we have heard about will we generally talk about will in normal sense then we use bailment the temporary transfer of possessions property one party to another then we have estoppel estoppel means the legal principle that prevents a person from asserting a fact inconsistent so in these terms we there are many so and so forth many many uh, phrases many clauses like this where we can spend a lot of time but the final thing is that you have to understand how these things are important so quid pro quo then inter alia inter alia is among other things so these things are really very important now sentence length could be decided on the basis of your understanding i told you in my uh, almost maybe like uh, in the later uh, lectures i would be explaining about the sentence length also that how the sentence length could be decided on the basis of your learning aspect and what is the requirement of your purpose further you can definitely go on with sentence length and a plain english movement disputed the structural complexity in legal writing and explored the opportunities for shortening the sentences remember that you can shorten the sentence like that and in this condition nominalization also plays a perfect role where nouns derived from verbs are often used instead of verbs such as to give consideration instead of to consider to be in opposition rather than to oppose to be in contravention rather than contravene to be in agreement instead to agree so these nouns nominalizations are used as lawyers do not to say to arbitrate so many nominalizations are used in order to explain the uh, words in a proper manner in order to give consideration to consider so this is what we generally use in legal english impersonal style is again a very important thing because a formal written words are used now in this condition use passive voice every time then along with that legal drafters use passive third person singular and plural nouns should be pronouns should be used that means he himself she herself they them you then that means like third person pronoun would be used and last but not the least everybody everyone every person is used when a provision applies to all everyone is equal over here so 
you remember these are capitalizations this is again a very important one our preamble this is a live example of using extensive use of capital words in legal english you can definitely go through these capitalization things where this is really very important last but not the least doublets and triplets where we use these words lands and ten tenements will and testament so that means we are using the words english french english latin english french english french so these are doublets and triplets remember and these are the th things that we generally try to use every now and then will and testament breaking and entering fit and proper let and hindrance have and hold so this is a combination of two things english and french sometimes sometimes english and latin so these are doublets and triplets another feature of latin english so bread and butter fast and furious chalk and talk many words are english and french remember so they are an examples of triplets also healthy wealthy wise here they are everywhere give device bequest so remember use of doublets and triplets in your english legal language so at the end i would like to say that with this note you all will definitely be able to draft on a perfect manner with precision clarity formality and rigorous work is required along with using those technical terminologies every time consistency and stability you must talk about lack of redundant words yeah because all these words are old now if they are usable then definitely of course you can do on but uh, if you can change them with the new version yes of course you are already invited and uh, like uh, uh, you are given that chance to change the uh, system ambiguity of our uh, interpretation yes you would should work on that ambiguity part use of prescribed forms which are given for each kind of legal writing authority and gravity is also required along with that influence and um, like historical and foreign elements so with this note i think these are the references that i have referred throughout my lectures and uh, you can definitely go through these books and uh, find yourself much convenient and uh, perfect platform to build up your uh, communication skills and your writing skills while going on with law reports with case reports with statutes with juristic writings so with this note i am dr divya gupta signing off for now maybe tomorrow in our next lecture we would be certainly discussing about the history the history of legal language in india and uh, basically yeah be prepared keep agile and active all the time everyone right thank you this is divya gupta signing off for now